So we're going to wrap up um, chapter 13 today and hopefully leave you, leave you guys feeling super prepared for your exam on Tuesday. It has the same exact format as your other exams. I'm going to figure out where we left off. Yeah, right about here. Thank you. So um, it has the same exact format, right? So you'll have mostly multiple choice. You'll have your choice of short answer questions, and then you'll have two multi-part case studies with the whole class period to do it. Hopefully our extra review slash kind of breakdown last night helped you a little bit, associate some of the structures with where they are to kind of build like a structure function relationship in your brain, because that's really important in this stuff, which is so conceptual. The nervous system is so conceptual. There's not a whole lot, you know, it's not like the bones or the muscular system where you, where you can like point to something. This is like a pathway, so it's moving, and there's all these different parts that do all of these different things. So it's pretty complex. So we're gonna to start tonight with sensory neurons. So these are all of that, so your book calls them pseudo-unipolar. I just call them unipolar. It's the same difference. Those are those unicorn-like neurons that have that cell body process off to the side, and we talked about that a little bit last night, how that dorsal root ganglion is that kind of cluster of cell bodies just outside of the central nervous system. So you have the cell body, right? Then you have a peripheral process and a central process. So these are the different extensions that come off of this unipolar um, Neuron. So one's the axon, right, and one would be uh, comparable to like the dendrite, right? It, and it, it's the same kind of setup. So we're used to thinking of these multipolar neurons, right? Most of our motor neurons are multipolar, right, where you have information coming in the dendrite through the cell body down the axon. It's the same idea. We're just not calling it a dendrite and an axon, right? You have the peripheral process and the central process, right? Or really the central process and the peripheral process, right? The, the peripheral process would be that um, axon-like structure, so it's kind of comparable to the axon. The central process is more comparable to the dendrites. So, in terms of our body, where this information flows, and we've drawn something like this before, do it over here, um, this kind of gingerbread man-like idea with our first order, second order, third order neurons, oops, okay, so a first order sensory neuron is one that's linked to the, the receptor, right, so sensory information comes into the body via a receptor, so the first order neuron's going to, and I'm just picking the arm, and I'm pretty sure I did something just like this the other day when, when we talked about it, but this first order neuron carries that information up to the spinal cord, first order. Right? The first order, and if you're drawing along, you might even want to use different colors to show these different levels, right? First order, it contains the receptor going up to the spinal cord. At our spinal cord, it's synapses with a second order neuron. Sometimes it's synapses in the brain stem, like at the medulla oblongata or the pons, it depends. I'm going to choose a different color because I already got blue. So the second order neuron takes that information up to the processing center. So this could be the thalamus if this is a somatic sense, like I've drawn here, a somatic sense like on the skin or something like that. Our second order neuron. This is going from the spinal cord to the thalamus. And then your thalamus relays that information via a third order neuron, right, up to your primary sensory cortex, and now you are consciously aware of it. So it's thalamus to primary sensory cortex. Notice we cross over Right, we're on opposite sides of the body. And so this is cool, right? I mean, think about it. You're feeling, so, like, wiggle your toes around your shoes. You're feeling something in your shoes right now, and there's really only three neurons separating your toes from your, the top of your brain. 
That's so cool, right? These things are so long. They carry that information so fast. As soon as I say wiggle your toes, you can do it, right? Stimulus is my, the sound of my voice telling me to do it. Prefrontal cortex decides to do it, sends the motor command out to actually make it happen, right? And then the sensory information comes back up and says, ooh, that feels funny to wiggle my toes in my shoes or whatever. Right? My socks are too tight, right? Whatever the thing is. Right? So showing you in step-by-step -step, kind of taking the body out of it and just looking at the neurons themselves and how they work, right? So nerve endings with sensory receptors. This would be our first order neuron, sending that action potential up. This is linking it to the spinal cord, right? It's coming into the spinal cord always through the dorsal root. And look where it synapses. There's another cell body there. And sometimes it's the cell body of that peripheral nerve. Look, this is all one long cell that comes up and then synapses in that posterior gray horn, right? Because these are unipolar neurons. So take a look at that, the shape there. It's synapsing in that posterior gray horn. It's coming in, whoops, coming in the, to that dorsal root. That dorsal root has all of the cell bodies. Oh my gosh, there we go, synapsing right there. It would synapse there with a second order neuron, which takes it up to the thalamus. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So there's also a posterior spinal column, right? Mm -hmm. so, so is is there a sensory information going up there too? Yes. So the sensory information doesn't go up through the gray horn. It just synapses there. Okay. And then I wish I could draw on this board, but um, and I'm sure I can. I'm just not smart enough. But the gist of it is, right? It comes in. It's going to synapse, synapse here, and then. It's gonna hop back over into the white matter and go up, okay. right? So this, the cell body's here, but then the axonal process goes out into that posterior column, right? The spinothalamic track, all of those, right? Tracks. It's gonna, it synapses right in there, and then hops on the highway up to the brain. The gray matter is just where the cell bodies are, kind of clustered for protection, really kind of huddle together. So sensory neurons are classified um, as either large diameter or small diameter. So large diameter um, have thick myelin, right? These are gonna be fast fibers. These are gonna conduct proprioceptive information, discriminative and non-discriminative touch information. So a lot of our tactile information is coming in this way. Small diameter, this is slower information. This is temperature, this is pain which sounds weird, right? I mean, if we're thinking about survival, what's, what's going to, to make or break us in, in survival mode? Knowing how, to, how something feels, right? Or being burned, right? Or being in pain, it's almost counterintuitive. But there's other mechanisms in place that, uh, that kind of counteract that. So, um, so it might seem a little strange, that the large diameter axons, which are really, really fast, large myelinated axons that are really, really fast, are the ones giving the seemingly not as important information. But, but you'll see as we go through, there's kind of a reason for that. All of our sensory neurons have what's called a receptive field associated with them. So let's go back to our little gingerbread guy here, and let's say the receptive field for this one sensory neuron is about that big. Right, that means anywhere in this field you can touch and that one sensory neuron will fire and activate and say something's touching me, right? And then there might be another receptive field for another sensory neuron, right? And another receptive field for another sensory neuron. So the receptive field is kind of the area that's associated with one specific sensory neuron. So body regions that aren't as detailed have a smaller or rather a larger receptive field. And we played around with this a little bit when we did the integumentary system. We had that two point discrimination test and we took those little pin pricky things on that little circular, it looked like a throwing star, right, that thing. And when you put it on your arm, when you're not looking, it's really hard to tell if it's one point or two points. But when you put it on the tip of your finger, it was really easy to tell. And that has to do with the receptive field of those touch receptors. It's easier for those touch receptors on your fingers to feel those two points as opposed to on your arm or the back of your neck or somewhere else that isn't quite as um, detailed. So that two-point discrimination threshold varies 
for part, different parts of our body. Sometimes it flicks when I'm just like hovering by it, and sometimes it doesn't flick at all. This is showing you that idea of a receptive field. Okay, I'm going backwards now, awesome. Okay, the other thing our skin can be broken down into not only just receptive fields, but also dermatomes. A dermatome is a map that links every area on your skin to a particular spinal nerve. Right? Every area on your skin, hence derma, right? every area on your skin is linked to a particular spinal nerve. And the reason these are important is because when you, not when you, if you get spinal infections, right, infections in your nervous system, this can be really helpful in diagnosing and figuring out exactly where this virus or bacteria is based upon the symptoms you're having on your skin. So a dermatome is literally a sensory nerve that is linked to a superficial area of your skin. So show you what I mean. Okay, so all of these different color-coded regions, remember we have 31 spinal cord segments, we have 31 spinal nerves. So if you count up all these, you'll find there's 31 of them, right? And so each area of our skin, so when you're touching the top part of the back of your head, that's cervical a spinal nerve number two that is sensing that, right? And so when you're touching kind of right here, that's cervical spinal nerve number three that's feeling that. And so this can help with diagnostics if you're uh, in a car accident and you're paralyzed or you're having numbing, tingling sensations. They can help localize and pinpoint exactly where in the spinal cord damage may have occurred. This also plays a huge role in um, uh, some viruses like shingles. The shingles virus uh, kind of lays dormant. Did anyone, if you guys are a lot younger than me, did anyone in here have chicken pox? You guys are probably all vaccinated. A handful of you did. Okay. So I had chicken pox when I was, I don't even know, like six or seven. Horrible, horrible. But I'm kind of glad I had it just to kind of live through it. That's like one of those like, yeah, like I did that. Like, no, 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 just kidding. Um, anyways, but to those of us that have had the chicken pox, this kind of mutated version of the chicken pox now lives within us. <laughs> and it's called the shingles virus. And it's living kind of in our, our nervous system and it just floats around and anything can trigger it. It's kind of random. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Remember this last semester, but I forgot. Um, why does why is it like you get the chicken pox when you're younger and then the shingles seems to strike when you're like older? It's dormant. It's, it's just like waiting. It's like hiding under a rock. It's like the immune system kind of just wears down as you get older and that's why the shingles is more prominent? It could or? be that. Yep. Sometimes it happens young. I mean, I've had friends that have had shingles. I'm not that old. Um, so it, 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 stress, diet, things like that, uh, hereditary factors, just your whole overall body chemistry can dictate whether or not, and some people never get shingles, right? They ha they've had the chicken pox and they live their whole life and then they'll never have a shingles outbreak. Um, but it literally, if you, if you see someone that has shingles or you talk to someone who has had shingles, they literally break out in a rash along this dermatome, like where that shingles virus is living in their, in their spinal cord, that's exactly where that rash is on their body. And it's literally like a line. So they can say, oh, you know, that's exactly, it's not, it's not all over the body like chickens, chicken pox was. It's just literally along one or maybe two spinal nerve segments on, on the dermatome map. So it's kind of creepy. You can, there is a vaccine for it, but you have to be old. You have to be like 65, 70, I think to get it. Um, because obviously elderly people, you know, people that, of that advanced age uh, are, it's not as easy for them to kind of bounce back from illnesses like that. So there's vaccines, um, but they're not as widely distributed. So referred pain is kind of cool. So referred pain is, it's a phenomenon that happens when the pain from the actual organ that is hurting expresses itself somewhere else in the body. So in other words, you feel pain in an area that's not actually hurt. <laughs> Sounds kind of weird, right? So this occurs because your spinal nerves carry both somatic and autonomic um, sensory fibers, right? So it's, it's all there because it's mixed. And sometimes they can travel along the same pathway as the somatic. So in other words, uh, a heart attack, for example, right? Going back to this dermatome, right? Check out where that dermatome is, right? So your heart right around that T3, T4, right? Uh, spinal nerve, but it also goes down your arm. So guess what? When your heart is in pain, where do you feel it? 
down your arm, right? It's that referred pain. Go ahead, Tim. Is it like appendicitis? Because I remember um, when my mom had like an appendix issue, she described it as like overall stomach pain. And then you know it's your appendix when it like slowly like works its way back to like where the appendix is. Yeah. Would that be a similar type of thing? Totally. So, whoops. So, and that again has to do with, it's that entire, so imagine that um, this autonomic sensory, right, this kind of subconscious, you're not aware of it, sensory information, and somatic sensory are literally going hand in hand right next to each other, but for some reason, your autonomic now kind of jumps onto and hitches a ride on the back of the somatic sensory now, right? That's literally what happens. So you feel it as a somatic sense. You feel it as it's actually happening. Because all that visceral stuff, you don't really feel. You don't feel when your heart's contracting. You don't feel when you know it's giving an extra squeeze when the heart rate elevates. You don't feel those things. But if your heart is gasping for breath, you feel it. Because your autonomic system hops a ride in your somatic nervous system, and you start to feel it in those referred areas. So there's different areas of your body that are kind of known for referred pain. You mentioned the appendix. There's also um, gallbladder. Your gallbladder pain, or your gallbladder is on your lower right side, right underneath your liver, uh, gallbladder pain is typically felt up in your shoulder area, on the back, upper back shoulder. It's really strange. It's a referred pain thing. It travels along that same sensory nerve, just hopping a ride. So I'm not gonna test you on the different maps or anything like that, but it's a cool idea to just understand, especially in your everyday life, right? When you're feeling things and living through things, you're like, oh, what, why is that? So this is just showing you overall, in general, big picture of how sensory nerve transmission happens, right? Always starting with some type of receptor, a chemoreceptor, a thermoreceptor, right? A proprioreceptor, all of those things, firing an action potential. Our sensory neurons look a little different than our motor neurons, right? They're unipolar, so they're not that typical like Medusa head looking neuron. They're that unicorn looking neuron. They synapse in those posterior gray horns and then they hop up maybe the posterior column pathway on up to the thalamus, second order neuron, synapse, third order neuron to go up to the cortex. That's when you consciously feel it, right? And so now we're gonna dive, you know, we're gonna diagram and start talking about the motor output, right? We did a flow chart like this in the last lecture or the lecture before, where we kind of started with a stimulus and then we went all the way up to the brain and then we came back out with motor output. That's exactly what we're doing now, but we're doing it in word form. We're explaining it and kind of breaking it down a little more today, okay? So just like we had first order, second order, third order neurons on the sensory side, we have upper and lower motor neurons on the motor side. So you feel this thing, right? Synapses, hops on that highway up through the spinal cord, gets up to the thalamus, relay to your primary sensory cortex. Your primary sensory cortex says, hey, we need to respond. There's always an interneuron in between. Interneurons are always the relay between sensory and, um, and uh, motor. And so it's gonna synapse and go to an upper motor neuron. The interneuron jumps, and now we're talking to an upper motor neuron. So I'll draw the interneuron. Always an interneuron in between. And now we have an upper motor neuron. Um, I don't want to draw it too far over there. Upper motor neuron. And it's going to cross over, right? And it synapses on the spinal cord. The lower motor neurons carry out into the periphery. The lower motor neurons have their cell bodies in those anterior or lateral gray horns. That's where the synapse occurs there. That's where that little junction occurs. And it's literally traveling, this is, a, they're mixed nerves, guys, so it's literally traveling down the same road that it went up, right? These are mixed spinal nerves. So it's literally traveling down that same road that it traveled up. So this is a lower motor neuron. And our upper motor neuron is purple here. There was an interneuron in between our sensory right, and motor up there, just kind of arcing between those two cortices. And those, of course, are going to go out and 
then stimulate some type of somatic response or contraction or something like that. Oops. There we go. So lower motor neurons, these are the ones whose cell bodies are in that, those uh, anterior gray horns or lateral gray horns. Sometimes they're in the brainstem if we're talking about a cranial nerve. So we have a motor neuron hole, right? a motor neuron hole. These are neurons that innervate the same muscle. So it's not gonna be just one single lonely neuron coming down and making your whole biceps contract, right? There's gonna be a group of neurons coming down because remember your muscles work in groups. Do you remember that, that whole idea of recruitment, right? And a motor unit, right? And so these neurons work in groups also. There's gonna be several groups of neurons coming to communicate with all the different fascicles of whatever muscle we're talking about. So there's large, oops, large motor neurons, smaller motor neurons. Our smaller motor neurons are usually associated with stretch receptors. So our smaller motor neurons, these are the ones that don't necessarily deal so much with the contraction but they're kind of monitoring the tension that's going on in the tendon. They're saying, wow, we have a lot of tension going on right now. There's a lot of stretching going on in this tendon. If we create any more tension, we might rip off the bone, right? So these smaller motor neurons help provide some sort of feedback, right? With a little bit of a stretch receptor. And we'll talk about stretch receptors when we get into reflexes. So the majority of our motor neurons are these large motor neurons they're with that excitation contraction coupling, the neuromuscular junction, all of those things that we're familiar with, that's what they do. So this is showing you kind of where they come from. Remember, um, they're gonna come out of that, that front, the frontal lobe is where most of our motor comes from, that primary motor cortex is on the frontal lobe. It's gonna come down, right, descending fibers. Sometimes we're synapsing in the thalamus, sometimes we're synapsing in the cerebellum, sometimes we're synapsing in the, in the brainstem. Whoops. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Just flipping back, forward. there. Sometimes we synapse in the brainstem, and sometimes we synapse in the spinal cord, right? Either way, it's going out the anterior, anterior root, right, of our, of our spinal cord, and then going out to our peripheral effector. Right, synapsing, and then just going right on out. We have our sensory neurons coming up, our motor neurons coming up. It, they would all be literally bundled together. The image makes it look like it's two separate fibers because technically at the very end, they are two separate fibers. But look, they're going up the same track. They're bundled together in the same fascicle, right? They're traveling together. It's not literally two separate strings. It's not like if, did you guys ever see that movie or heard of that thing when the guy's arm, he was out for a hike and his arm got crushed and he had to like chop off his own arm to save his life. I used to show that when I taught high school. So literally he, his arm was stuck under a boulder. He was like in this canyon, like in Utah. And his arm was crushed and he knew the only way he was going to survive is if he cut his own arm off. So I think he had like a Swiss army knife or a rock or something like super rudimentary to cut through the bone and everything. The bone was broken, so that wasn't that big of a deal. He basically cut through everything and, and the last thing that was left, he saw it was a white string and he knew that was the nerve. There wasn't two white strings. It wasn't one that was sensory, one that was motor. It's one white string that's going down your arm, right? And he said when he cut that, he knew that it was gonna be excruciating pain. And of course it was, he, was, he described it as like blinding lightning pain, you know, for a second and it slowly, I mean, <laughs> he cut his arm off and didn't like go away, you know? But uh, yeah, he, I mean, he survived. They made a movie about him. I didn't show the movie, I showed like the documentary like Dateline thing or whatever. That's really cool, you should look it up if you've never heard about Amazing. it. He didn't like pass out. I, I think he did. Movie, didn't he pass was, out? No. Oh. He cut it and then just booked it. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy. The things that you do though when you're in that like survival mode, it's really cool. So this, I put these pictures kind of separate, right? So there's this one and this one, but together it's this. And this is all from your book. So it's literally putting the ideas together. That sensory information comes up, motor information goes down, all leaving through the same white string, right? Okay, so let's talk about reflexes. So not all of our reflexes are the same. Um, our reflexes are survival mechanisms. These are ways of kind of bypassing the typical 
root that we've drawn over there, right? So a reflex is something that happens, if bless you, happens a lot quicker than that. In other words, it's something that needs such immediate attention to our survival and our safety that it's not worth that sensory information coming up, synapsing, going to the thalamus, et cetera, et cetera. Because remember that concept of synaptic delay. With every single synapse, there's a little bit of a delay because you have to release the neurotransmitter, bind to the receptor, cause a local depolarization, get to threshold, and then continue the action potential, right? And so the more, the more synapses you have, the slower the reaction will be. And so this is not always the most efficient way to do things in the body, which enter reflexes. Our reflexes do that. So it's an integration between a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. Here, at best, we have five or six neurons in this interchange, right? First order, second order, third order, interneuron, and then an upper and a lower motor neuron. We're talking six neurons there. In a reflex arc, it could be two. We could, we could be talking about just one synapse. Literally, a sensory neuron just synapsing with a motor neuron, or maybe three. A sensory neuron synapsing with an interneuron synapsing with a motor neuron much, much quicker and more efficient in terms of movement, right? But of course, then it's harder to regulate that because it happens so quick. So the way our reflexes work, basically, is they bypass the central nervous system. Most of our information comes in sensory, goes up to our central nervous system, our spinal cord and brain, and then comes back down. Our reflex arc bypasses that. It happens all in the periphery. It happens in the outside. So. There's a couple different uh, receptors and things like that that play a role in reflexes. So let's do this. Reflexes, let's talk about special receptors. So there's something called a muscle spindle. We alluded to it already. A muscle spindle is in skeletal muscle. And it's literally a stretch receptor. It's looking at how stretched the tendons are, how stretched your muscles are to produce the tension. So they're literally monitoring the tension and the force of contraction. So this is why you won't be able to lift something that's too heavy for you. Right? You, you can't lift something that's too heavy for you because your muscles would literally rip off the bone. Your muscle spindles prevent that from happening. They say, nope, not today. All right, tension and contraction. So, uh, muscle spindles are, they kind of work in conjunction with those small uh, motor neurons, so they activate and, and, uh, and give feedback to those small motor neurons. Whoops. There we go. Nope. There we go. Okay. So we have a couple other terms to introduce with these stretch receptors. We have primary afferents and we have secondary afferents, right? So a primary afferent is going to first respond when stretch happens. The secondary response to like the static link. So this is like with a sustained contraction. Your secondary afferents are providing feedback and information. So primary So this is for sustained contractions. This is with initial contraction. There's also something called a Golgi tendon organ. So it basically does the same thing as our muscle spindle. It's a backup plan. They help each other. This one is located in the tendon. So our muscle spindle is located in the muscle, 
Our Golgi tendon organ is located in the tendon that's attaching the muscle to the bone. So this is again limiting the amount of stretch that can happen, limiting the amount of contraction that can happen, making sure that that muscle is just going to rip off the periosteum and flop. Within tendon, monitoring stretch. So this is showing you kind of where they are, right? Golgi tendon organ in the tendon, muscle spindle embedded in the muscle fibers themselves. So our reflexes have to meet, uh, or they're classified rather by two different criteria. The number of synapses, I had mentioned they can either have two or three synapses, and then the type of organ that they're actually involved in. So let's kind of take a look at some of these. The simplest reflex arcs are what we call monosynaptic, right? Just one synapse. Sensory neuron, motor neuron. Easy peasy, right? And then we have polysynaptic reflexes that involve more than one synapse. So we'll look at some of these. A simple stretch reflex. A simple stretch reflex. This is that patellar reflex. This is you go to the doctor, you sit on the table, your legs dangle, they knock you with that little hammer, right? This patellar reflex is literally, it is a, uh, a, a kind of your, your body's way of monitoring the stretch that is on that patellar tendon. When they knock your knee, right, you're sitting there on the table, and they come at you with that hammer out of, out of nowhere. They knock that tendon. Literally, they're pushing the tendon in, which stretches it, right? Your tendon's sitting there. But when they knock it, they're doing that to it, and it stretches, right? And that stretch causes this extension, right? And so that's what that patellar reflex is. It's literally your body's response to that tendon being stretched. It's called a stretch reflex. The patellar reflex is a stretch reflex. So the basic steps here, and a ref, yeah, I guess I can erase this. Uh, the basic steps in a reflex, such as the stretch reflex, is you have some type of stimulus, right? This is gonna look very similar to what we were drawing before, but we're kind of leaving the central nervous system out of it. Central nervous system has nothing to do with it. We have our stimulus, we have our sensory fiber, Right, our sensory nerve fiber sending information up. Muscle spindles are the receptor in this case. Um, stimulus detected by muscle spindles. Right. In the spinal cord, we have a synapse. Sensory neuron synapses. And then we have a motor neuron, right? Motor neuron response. In this case, it was extension. Much shorter, right? Bingo, bango. Is so, monosynaptic. Yes, this would be a monosynaptic. Yep. So Golgi tendon reflexes are polysynaptic reflexes, so they're gonna have more than just the one, right? These are gonna cause the relaxation on the other side. So, we can call it a contralateral reflex, which means it's gonna work on the opposite side of the body. So think about it, if you are, um, extending this leg, right, you're extending that leg, your other leg needs to stay relaxed, otherwise you're going to fall, right? So the Golgi tendon reflex is going to inhibit the opposite, the opposite muscle. So the motor neurons that inhibit, or the motor neurons that innervate the opposing muscles are going to be inhibited in this Golgi tendon reflex. 
right? So it's kind of the opposite of the stretch reflex. It's going to occur tandem with the stretch reflex that's going to help keep your muscles from being confused if they're being told to flex or contract or relax. They're, it's just the extensors that are being told what to do. The flexion reflex or the withdrawal reflex is kind of this touch a hot stove and pull back or step on something sharp and lift your foot up again, right? So that's the flexor reflex. And sometimes it's called the withdrawal reflex. And so here, again, we're talking about maybe some nociceptors being involved, right? You step on a Lego, you step on a tack, you step on something and you're like, ooh, I don't like that, like hot, 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 hot pavement, whatever. Right? So this is gonna cause your limb to withdraw from the pain or flex away from the pain. Touch a hot stove, right? So with that, you also have a crossed extensor reflex. So this is similar in idea to the Golgi tendon reflex. So the crossed extensor reflex maintains extension on the opposite side of the body. In other words, when you're walking and you step on something sharp and you have that flexor reflex happen on the right side of your body, the left side of your body is extending reflexively. It's not going to flex because what would happen if the left side of your body flexed while the right side of your body was flexing reflexively? You'd have no legs and you'd fall. Right? And so this cross extensor reflex maintains extension on the opposite side of the body that is withdrawing. So it's really important to keep your balance and keep you upright. Right? And so the, you have your flexor reflex, and this is all synapsing, right? This is just going right through the spinal cord, not going up to the brain. Eventually your brain becomes aware of it. Right? This does not show, there's actually another neuron here that kind of takes that signal up to the brain, so your brain eventually is aware of what's going on, and your brain can override it. In lab next week, um, we will do some reflex things, and you'll have a chance to see, and, and what happens is students all sit there, and they have the little patellar um, hammer, and they're like, I don't, I don't have a patellar reflex. Well, it's because you're thinking about it and your brain can override it, right? Your brain can consciously say, nope, not going to do it. Watch me. I'm special. I don't have this. Everyone has it. We're all working properly. It's just you're consciously aware of the fact that we're testing it, so you're overriding it. So just like with the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain, the cerebrum can kind of override some of those basic things. The cerebrum can override some of these basic reflexes. It doesn't mean... If so, for example, your your gut reaction when you touch something hot is to pull it away, right? Because of those nociceptors, and you might feel that at first. But if you really want to hold on to something hot, you can because your cerebral cortex can make that decision for you, right? You can do that. Um, and so, at any point here, it, the cross extensor reflex is not an example of, of your brain being able to override that because it all happens so quick. But you can override some of these reflexes um, if you're consciously aware of them. They usually happen so quickly, you don't know. So there are some reflexes that are associated with our cranial nerves. So these are all these are all reflexes that deal directly with those 12 cranial nerves that we mentioned last time. The gag reflex, the blink reflex. These are also ways that someone would check for brain damage, right? They're looking to see if you have this kind of blinking reflex, right? If something's coming at your face, right? If I throw something at your face, maybe your reflex is to catch it. <laughs> but if, if, you're, if you're not, if you haven't trained that reflex to catch something, you're at least going to blink or maybe turn your head away, right? The gag reflex is triggered when something's stuck in the back of your throat, something touches the back of your throat. Um, and some people have uh, much more sensitivity to that than others. One of my roommates, and I'm not, if you gag while you brush your teeth, I'm not like making fun of you, but I don't gag when I brush my teeth. So when I went to college and I found someone that did, I was like, what? whoa, that, that must suck. Like every time you brush your teeth, you're like, Bleh. like, oh, oh man, I don't know if I'd ever brush my teeth, but goodness. Um, yeah, because some people 
are super sensitive to that. It's the glossopharyngeal nerve that you have to think for that, uh, thank for that. Um, so let's talk about some neuropathies that happen with these. So neuropathies are when our nerves aren't doing what they're supposed to do, right? Um, disorders that impact our nervous system. So it's going to depend on which nerve, right? The, the effects are going to depend on which, which spinal nerve is being affected. Lower motor neurons disorders, these are usually um, the result of some type of major injury, like a car accident or something like that, impacting how the motor nerves get out of the spinal cord. So an example here, uh, there's a, a reflex that's very common in babies and people with brain, uh, brain, uh, brain deadness. Oh my gosh, I can't think of the word. People who are brain dead, there we go. Um, so normally, if someone were to come up and run something underneath your toe, you and ladies, when you go, guys, you get a pedicure, right? That kind of happens automatically. You tend to kind of squeeze your foot away and like down away from that kind of tickliness on the inside. But something called the Babinski sign, which they do this in Grey's Anatomy a lot. If you watch their surgery, someone will like touch their foot and look for this sign when they do brain surgeries. The Babinski sign is when instead of having that normal kind of curl back, they actually kind of open up instead. And this has to do with those motor neurons uh, not responding like they should. It's, a, it's an out, outward sign that there's some type of, of damage, some type of neuropathy or disorder involved there. Other upper motor neuron disorders. So again, when we're talking upper motor neuron, we're talking up in the brain and the spinal cord, right? These are the, the major things. So sometimes this can result from something anywhere along the pathway being damaged. So it doesn't just have to be a brain damage thing, right? It can be anywhere along the pathway resulting in upper motor neuron damage. So the body's response uh, would then be kind of a, a shock. Maybe you lose all uh, ability to, to control your movements or uh, to, to feel sensations for a while until it's all reestablished. So um, we'll go, oh, Babinski sign, we mentioned that already. Um, it, if you go to a newborn, they will have that up until about 18 months of age. You can do that and they will kind of span out instead of curl up. And that's just because their brain's still developing. Um, okay, let's talk about ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. So this disease is a progressive disorder, it comes on later in life. Uh, a couple years ago, well, it was probably like 10 years ago now, they did that water, ice water bucket challenge thing where people would like dump water on their heads and like take a video of it. I don't even remember how long ago that was, but anyways, that was for ALS awareness. Um, shows how good that went, if we're not familiar with it, but that's okay. Um, so this is basically when those motor neurons uh, are fading away. Think of them as literally like shriveling away and not and not working anymore. So your body feels all the things, but you're physically unable to move. And so it starts with something as simple as walking or grasping, and then eventually it can turn very deadly with breathing, right? Because you need your skeletal muscles to breathe, right? You need your diaphragm to breathe. So all of those things slowly become paralyzed. It's very, very um, debilitating. There's a really cool, um, movie called Lorenzo's Oil. It's old, old, like before my time old, but it's a really good movie. Um, it's, a, it's a story of, of a child that has ALS, so obviously it's sad, but the parents kind of take it into their own hands to like research and find out about it because this was back in like the late 70s or early 80s when nothing was known about it and they they kind of dis discover that it, it can be impacted by your diet. So if you if you drink and eat these certain things, it can help offset the effects of this disorder, which is pretty cool. But Another thing, and I'm pretty sure it was ALS, um, there was a Saints player who had it, and they did like a football life documentary on him, and they like covered like, they didn't like in detail show the progression of him, you know, regressing, but yeah. like you could see like over time, he went from like this full blown athlete, full control of everything, to eventually dying in a wheelchair, but like crazy. it was, and it wasn't like super long ago, so I'm pretty sure if you looked it up, you could find something. I'm really certain it was ALS, but I'm not like yeah. 100% certain. There's a couple others that exhibit the same type of like degradation over time, yeah. but yeah, this, this one unfortunately is, is very much more common. Um, so this one, once signs kind of onset, death is usually within five years it's because of because of those skeletal muscles not being able to contract, especially the respiratory um, muscles. Oh wow, I'm not really moving on. So that's that, guys. Um, we covered everything that you need for your 